ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन टुडे अगेन ऑन मंडे मॉर्निंग even if, even if patient is and, uh, nearing towards that, what exactly uh, as a palliative care physician we should be doing and how we should uh, be uh, what what should be our aim and what where, where, how long we can start and we should start antibiotics this is very important topic and we should listen carefully and for this topic again there is a team from T tata memorial hospital mumbai and i request dr jaita to introduce uh, speakers and moderator and uh, start the class thank you hello Dr. good Jaita. morning thank you thank you sushma ma'am for uh, uh, having us for, for doing this topic uh, so good morning everybody on the meeting today uh, to present the topic on antibiotics in end of life we have dr ajila who is our uh, second year resident in md palliative medicine in tata memorial hospital um a uh, dr ajila has uh, uh, done a poster presentation recently completed i have gone 2023 and her topic was early palliative care referral patterns and symptom prevalence in advanced colorectal cancer patients Uh, Dr. Ajila's key areas of interest are palliative care in pediatric solid tumors, uh, in adult hematoma oncology, and in chronic heart failure. Apart from her uh, in, uh, dedication and interest in palliative medicine, uh, Dr. Ajila is a very keen follower of a fitness regime, and she is continuously working on that for to help herself. as well as encourage the rest of her uh, colleagues and teammates and in the department he included and uh, we often de stress with our cup of coffee in our coffee club so dr ajila is going to present this topic uh, to moderate this session we have dr shamli pujari who uh, has completed her md palliative medicine training uh, with us and uh, since then she has done her senior residency post in tata as well as in km hospital in mumbai uh, from last year she's been working as an assistant professor uh, she has uh, uh, done uh, the echo program for pediatric palliative care she has been the co organizer in the asco uh, pcsc pro uh, asco palliative care e course program that we have conducted over the last two years and she has been the recipient of the idea pc award in 2022 she has presented in national as well as international conferences so uh, dr shamli will be moderating and uh, over to you dr ajila Okay, thank you, ma'am. So, good morning, everyone. So, the topic for today is antibiotics in end of life. So, uh, the outline of the whole PPT will be like there will be an introduction. There will we'll be going will we'll be going on to the definitions, the pros and cons of using antibiotics in end of life. the factors associated with it the common infections and the organisms which are associated in uh, end of life then we'll go through uh, a series of studies and surveys to get a uh, gist of this and how it can be applied to a common case scenario as well as different decision making models algorithms and finally we'll come on to the treatment and the summary so uh, before going into all of that uh, we'll first check a uh, see on the integrated model of care that is the relationship between the therapy to modify the palliative care and the supportive care so palliative care is something which is applied from the presentation uh, that is diagnosis of the patient till the bereavement of the patient and the small uh, period that is uh, present just before the uh, patient's death is what is the end of life and this is where we'll be we will be focusing on so what is exactly end of life and what are 
uh, what is can can it be synonymously used with other terms like terminally ill actively dying and end of life so end of life per se is that part of a life of a person where the person is actually living with and is impaired by an eventually fatal condition and even when the prognosis is unknown so this is what what the definition of end of life is but when comparing with actively dying so actively dying is uh, actually referring to all dying patients who will be undergoing a series of stereotypical pattern of signs and symptoms in days before their death so this actively dying uh, term is used to actually in relation to the trajectory uh, which means that the patient will be undergoing imminent death the next term is terminal condition so terminal condition is nothing but a progressive condition that has no cure and that can be reasonably expected to cause death in a foreseeable future so these terms are actually slightly different so let's come to the role of palliative medicine in end of life so we all know the basic principle is to improve the quality of life in patients facing problems associated with life threatening illness so the question for the day is whether suspected infections in end of life should be treated or not so that is what the question is should all the patients with infection should be treated with antibiotics in end of life should all patients without infection should be treated so that is the question for the day so so antibiotics in end of life is it palliative or is it non palliative uh, the approach to the decision making as to whether to start antibiotics or not to start antibiotics what are the common indications for starting antibiotics uh what are the common contraindications what are the benefits and burden of starting antibiotics and what are the common myths and common concepts so everyone deserves a good death without pain and suffering so so that is the role of antibiotics why we are giving antibiotics in end of life is actually to improve the quality of life and to attain a good death so uh, what is the role exactly so the patient who is in end of life will be having fatigue pain discomfort there will be a lot of distress due to sepsis the patient uh, might be subjected to multiple hospitalization and also antibiotics can prolong the survival if given for the right patients and can improve the quality of life but then again why is antibiotics in end of life question so much why can't we give antibiotics to all patients in end of life or give a trial or we or try to uh, start antibiotics in all patients who has an infectious etiology so the pro problems with that is the non restricted use can lead to potential risk of allergic reactions antibiotic associated diarrhea a different taste as well as anorexia nausea vomiting all these can happen as well as another point of importance is the emergence of multi drug resistant bacteria the next thing is invasiveness because in end of life some patients may not be able to take it orally so we might need to go for an iv antibiotic another thing of concern is a drug drug interaction for example methadone which inhibits cytochrome uh, for 50 which can be lethal when combined with antibiotics like macrolides or fluoroquinolone so coming on to what are the factors that are uh, associated with antimicrobial use in end of life so when talking about um, end of life we are commonly referring to the older age group which have will be having a lot of comorbidities they might be having adva in advanced stages of cancer as well as other things like dementia so in this specific age group there they will be already have undergone immunosenescence they might be having immunosuppressed uh, immune suppression that is because of the uh, maybe because of cancer chemotherapy or due to other conditions and uh, with age there is always a gut microbe dysbiosis so when attempting to give antibiotics in such a uh, age group or a population this can, this have a significant impact that is this can lead to clostridium difficile infection there can be emergence of multi drug resistance this can increase the length of the hospital stay and also contribute to mortality of the patient so which are the infections uh, that are common in a dying patient so infections are common in a dying patient and uh, based on the site of infection this can be a urinary tract where the patient will be present with dysuria fever and other symptoms respiratory tract where the patient will be ha having dyspnea or cough or other and other symptoms mouth or pharyngeal infection skin subcutaneous and finally septicemia so uh, this is actually taken from a ohio study uh, which was uh, conducted and Uh, in this uh, there was good response uh, symptom improvement to urinary tract infections which we will be coming on to later 
So uh, let's look upon the common organisms causing infections. In this, we have got E. coli, Staph aureus, and Enterococcus species uh, in the first three. And all of them are mostly common cells in the body, which causes infection, along with other organisms like Lepsiella, Candida, Protease, Mirabilis, etc. So uh, let's have a look at the antibiotic spectrum. So we have got the penicillin group of antibiotics, cephalosporins. We have got the amino penicillins with beta lactamase inhibitors, quinolones, amino glycosides, and other drugs. So what is commonly used for uh, antibiotics, according to the studies, in end of life are the third generation cephalosporin as well as the fourth generation, which is very well uh, preferred. Maybe because the uh, cefepim, which is a drug which uh, has got a very broader spectrum, which is covering both gram positive, gram negative bacillus, as mentioned, E. coli, Klebsiella pseudomonas, which is mentioned as earlier, the common organisms causing uh, infections in end of life, as well as uh, as uh, well as the next one that is amino penicillins with beta beta lactamase inhibitors, which also has has got a gram positive and gram negative coverage. Then another drug that is important and commonly used in most of the studies as well as in end of life is quinolones, especially levoflox, ciproflox, which has got a uh, greater uh, broad spectrum coverage. And another uh, drug that has to be kept in mind is metronidazole because in end of life, as, uh, as these patients may, may be present with pressure sores or ulcers or even malignant wounds, which can be infected. So the infected wound can be a uh, polymicrobial, which uh, can consist of superficial aerobic as well as deeper anaerobic. So metronidazole has a good role uh, in controlling infections in such uh, patient population. So the problem is to decide uh, what is right or what is wrong for each patient. And to be honest, it depends on case to case scenario. So in order to uh, deal with this conundrum, we'll be going through a series of studies as to arrive at a consensus as to how to deal with uh, or how to approach this uh, scenario wherein antibiotics has to be given in end of life. So firstly, we'll be going, looking into this Ohio study. This is basically a prospective study, which was of a 24 month duration. The sample size was 1,731 patient, and it was to determine the effect of antimicrobes uh, on the infection related symptoms, as mentioned earlier, for example, based on the site, uh, UTI, which can result in dysuria, respiratory like dyspnea. So all these related symptoms, the related survival, the symptom response. So the symptom response was uh, explained as 72 hours of starting antibiotics as well as patient survival. So this is what was uh, looked for in this Ohio study. And uh, they came up with the conclusion that antimicrobials are routinely prescribed for the large majority of infection in that patient population. There was good symptom control with urinary tract infection, but the symptom improvement was not that much uh, in other infection sites like mucositis, respiratory tract infection, etc. So, uh, and as well as they have mentioned, they also looked upon the patient survival, and the patient survival did not appear to be affected by the use of antibi antibiotics. So, so they also came up with a set of guidelines for antibiotic use, and uh, this had a principle of shared decision making. That is, uh, the decision on to give uh, whether to give antibiotics is not only by the physician itself, but also by the family as well as the surrogate decision maker. So the principle of shared decision making is one important thing. Uh, the next thing is the major indication to be considered for starting antibiotics has to be symptom control uh, as to ease the distress of the patient. And the third thing that has to be key, uh, kept in mind while starting antibiotics is that antimicrobial uh, treatment uh, may not be effective in all cases of infection as which was a major finding in this study because it, there was a good improvement in uh, urinary tract infection with a symptom improvement of 79%. So infection, one thing to keep in back of mind is infection may occur as a terminal event uh, because uh, this, this is also called as the dying patient's best friend. So next we'll uh, look upon the SPIDENT study. So this was a retrospective study in almost 160 patients. And in this study, uh, they uh, uh, went to went on to look on the associated factors like vitamin D as well as CRP. And also they went, did investigations like cultures to find out what is the, uh, did, it have, did antimicrobial administration have a positive effect or a negative effect? So they came up with the conclusion that antibiotic treatment in their uh, 
population improved symptom in 37% of their patients. Uh, and one important finding they had was that the pa uh, patients to whom uh, who had a negative culture also had a uh, improvement in symptom improvement with administration of antibiotics. And uh, they have also mentioned about the adverse events, the prevalence of adverse events with antibiotics. They were claiming to be very it was not that common. So. So most of this study was uh, one of the limitations or the difficulty they faced was uh, it was difficult to assess if a patient was actually dying or they were undergoing uh, suffering from a temporary deterioration. So that was one major limitation most of the studies were talking about. So this uh, retrospective study also mentioned of the phenomenon called as inflammation. So this inflammation is actually a dysregulation of the innate immune responses. So the aging body will have a dysregulation of the innate immune response responses. This would lead to an elevated CRP levels. So normally CRP levels is one, we, one thing we use in clinics to identify the presence of infection. So actually this elevated CRP is a good prognostic marker for estimation of time of death. So so since we use CRP for uh, monitoring infection, the CR raised to CRP levels in an end-of-life patient can be misinterpreted and the patient can undergo unnecessary antibiotic treatment. So inflammation is one phenomenon that needs to be kept in mind. So when we are treating an infection at end-of-life, are we really prolonging the dying process? Is that good or bad for the patient? So let's look upon the ethical concerns about the anti-infective use at the end of life. So <clears throat> the ethical concerns mainly involved are this can delay transition to hospice, prolong a dying process, uh, and also whenever the life expectancy is shorter, the, uh, the regimens we prescribe for these patients can be incongruent with the goals of care as well. And Another important thing is, as mentioned earlier, the patient can act, act as a reservoir, reservoir of uh, multiple drug resistance. Then, obviously, the cost on the human resources, which is also important ethical concern. So the next, uh, we will look upon the review of literature. This is actually a US-based review of literature in which uh, they were trying to characterize the infections and their management uh, in oncology patients at the end of life. So this included mainly eight studies and uh, what they finally came up with was whenever we are treating patients uh, in end of life, uh, when we are thinking of antibiotics, we should always uh, assess what is our objective, what, what is the objective as to why we are starting. So. Uh, Antibiotics can always be started in a patient, in an incurably ill cancer patient or any other patients uh, where the objective is symptom control. So the main idea is of symptom control to decrease the uh, symptom burden. So, uh, so in this case, so when we are instituting antibiotics as a symptom control objective, the intent automatically becomes a palliative intent. So and using antibiotics in such scenario, antibiotics are palliative. So when does antibiotics become non-palliative? So when the infections are not directly related to the patient's symptoms. So signs and symptoms the patient is facing is not related to the infection itself, or the patient is having a multi-system deterioration, or uh, in a very moribund case, then the antibiotics can be considered as non-palliative. So, and uh, each and every pa patient or cases has to be, you know, has to be given an individualized approach because each case can be different according to the presentation as well as the presence or absence of infection and the general condition of the patient. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, it is always uh, important to keep, uh, to see if it is a terminal event because Patients can uh, undergo repeated infections, repeat, uh, repeated trajectory, uh, trajectory in which there is repeated infection, and finally, this can lead to end of life. So that should also be kept in mind. So the next uh, survey we'll, look more, look, we'll be looking upon is a HOPE survey. So the HOPE survey is actually a, a German survey which included 448 patients. So uh, in uh, they were looking upon all the advanced cancer patient and they were trying to quantify the antibiotic prescribing practices as well as the uh, decision making. They uh, looked upon decision making as to when to start the antibiotics, when to withheld and when to withhold antibiotics and the reasons uh, or the factors that led to this. So uh, for this survey, they used a specialized questionnaire that was uh, devised by the task force and uh, which was uh, converted into clinical weakness and then turned into questionnaire to assess the uh, to look to quantify the antibiotic pres prescribing practices so the 
conclusion they came up with uh, with was the antibiotics should be commonly used to improve the quality of life but not the quantity of life and uh, the physician is given the task of balancing the benefits as well as the burdens which was mentioned earlier as well as uh, when it comes to withdrawing or withholding antibiotics there were there was high tension in the physicians so uh, in this they uh, they have mentioned the decision for initiation of antibiotic therapy was taken mostly alone by the physician whereas when it comes to stopping antibiotics in end of life in these subset of patients there it was a team decision so uh, life prolongation so we talked about life prolongation from slide 1 itself is it a benefit or a burden so we might think it is a benefit to all patients for life prolongation but that is not the case so looking at a palliative care perspective uh, one thing we should keep in mind is the closer the patient is already to death the antibiotics will be having less effect on prolonging life and other thing is like the Uh, the situation of benefit of burden varies from patient to patient that is because for some peers, for some patient or patient relatives uh, like getting another day of seeing their loved ones will be very beneficial will be like very good thing for them whereas for some patients who are having a lot of distress a lot of pain and even though we give a lot of symptom management uh seeing their uh, loved ones suffer like that would be burdensome burdensome for for other patients so the scenario depends upon the patient and we have to go for an individualistic approach for each, each and every case so uh, there are certain situation in which antibiotics are purely palliative and that is for pain of sinusitis dental abscess cellulitis and protitis and in these condition if at all are present in end of life to uh, we can always give antibiotics in with a palliative intent so what are the factors uh, that are aff affecting the decision to treat an infection or not so as mentioned earlier it is highly individual based it depends upon character of the patient and the family the psychosocial circumstances the patient's religious beliefs as well as the cultural context next we'll look upon the general physician perception about end of life Uh, about antibiotics in end of life so this was a survey which was a four month old survey in which they tried to characterize the physicians attitudes towards the end of life and what were the reasons why they were continuing or withdrawing antibiotics so uh, the final conclusion that this survey came up with was the physicians that is the general physicians they always uh, give importance to the patient autonomy that is they respected the patient's wish as well as the relatives wish as to whether whether to continue the antibiotics in end of life so they opted for a shared decision making model when it comes to uh, antibiotic administration in end of life and they all agreed to the fact that giving antibiotics in end of life led to contributed to uh, antibiotic resistance and when it comes to physicians as compared to palliative physicians physicians always had a responsibility to the public as well as the patient that they should somehow cure and there was a lot of tension as compared to uh, in case of physicians as compared to palliative physicians so uh, in this survey they uh, went through the uh, causes as to uh, where the antibiotic antibacterials were continued in end of life and the clinical scenarios in which the physicians opted for continuing treatment was for mainly pneumonia as well as cns infection which consisted 58% and 57% and when uh, given asked for the perspectives uh, or the reasons for the continuation or discontinuation of antimicrobials at the end of life one of the major thing they said was a patient's request to uh, continue or discontinue antibiotics the request of a family member and the uh, places where they actually intended to treat was relieving pain as well as to decrease the work of breathing so uh, we talked about the uh, shared decision making uh, with the relatives as well as the family uh, family relatives and the patient so how to exactly approach such a decision making regarding antimicrobial use because uh, if uh, if asked like you know for uh, example a patient or a loved one is sick and if the, if asked the family whether there is a need to continue antimicrobials obviously each and every person who loves would say ki like we would like to continue antimicrobials do everything and each and everything that is possible to save the patient so uh, so how to approach such scenarios and how to actually uh, make the patients and family understand the importance 
so we have a step by step approach in which step one we have to initially assess where a patient and their family are in decision making process regarding end of life care step two we have to clearly make out the goals is it curative or palliative in nature and if at all if at all it is palliative then addressing antimicrobial use may be indicated so uh, we were talking about the approach to decision making and antibiotic use so it is always important to inform the patient and the family that one important phenomenon is that infection are expected to happen near the end of life and this can obviously uh, often be a terminal event in the patient's life so uh, another important thing is like most of the patients uh, when asked whether you need treatment or not with antibiotics they will obviously opt for a yes because they need everything they need want to do everything that needs to be done uh, so uh, any intervention regarding antimicrobial use at the end of uh, end of life should involve education and training of patients and families so for this uh, they uh, this specific and the microbial study has come up with health literacy interventions this proposed health literacy intervention were uh, designed to make the patient and the relatives understand the uh, importance uh, and how to exactly to educate them on what is the importance of antibiotics in end of life so uh, this includes readdressal of the goals of care to uh, identify the therapies that are consistent with the goals of care, that is to prevent all sort of interventional therapies or invasive therapies and describe the need for pre hospitalization as explain the risk and benefits of antimicrobial therapy and also to uh, properly explain a purely palliative approach so uh, so it always comes down to us that what to be done in each and every patient so when it when the decision becomes difficult we can always stop and think that if it is a morbid patient who is having a progressive and incurable disease Uh, is it justifiable to give antibiotics for a patient who is having a degree uh, declining trajectory for an intracurrent infection so that could mean that it could be the natural end point of the dying process so we should always stop and think when to give antibiotics and whom to give antibiotics so whenever the decision making as mentioned earlier becomes difficult we can go for what is called as a two day rule that is if after two days of general symptom management without antibiotics the patient is clinically stable then we can start the patient on antibiotics and at the same time we have got something called as a reverse two day rule according to pcf so uh, if if there is a poor survival or if there is a poor response after starting antibiotics after a few days or the, if you think the patient is going to a moribund state then we can always stop the antibiotics so another important part we should always uh, to keep in mind is we uh, treat mainly with antibiotics for symptom control for uh, for improving the quality of life another important aspect is that antibiotics can be used to relieve infection related pain this is very important because the patient uh, especially uh, having severe pain associated with infection around a malignant tumor uh, mal be it a malignant tumor be it an ulcer or be it a wound if it is present in certain areas like neck gluteal region or ulcerated uh, uh, cancer or maybe if it is in the perineum all these can lead to severe pain in end of life and antibiotics can play an important role in decreasing the pain related to such infections and in some patients uh, there are there can be a rapid increase in the pain intensity which can be complicated with other conditions like delirium so antibiotics can actually play a role in uh, relieving infection related pain so the common infection we as already mentioned is a mixture of aerobic and deeper anaerobic infections so another important thing that is seen in this group of patients is ascending cholangitis which uh, can result as a result of a partially obstructed or a standard common bile duct so uh, this can cause systemic disturbances if not treated promptly and for ascending cholangitis we can go forth with piperacillin uh, tazobactam 4.5 g iv over 3 30 minutes q8 hourly and if the patient is having septic shock also give a single dose of gentamicin 5 mg per kg so whenever the iv administration is difficult we can always go for an intramuscular injection with ceftriaxone or ceftriaxone so another uh, area of importance is the uh, uh, utis because utis are the ones that has got good response when it comes to end of life with antibiotics so uh, in case of uncomplicated uti we can treat with nitrofurantoin 50 mg per oral qds or 100 mg 
per oral BD, or we can treat with co amoxiclav. In case of MRSA UTI, uh, in confirmed MRSA UTI, treat according to local guidelines, or if it is a pyelonephritis or you're suspecting a systemic sepsis, then vancomycin 1 to 1.5 gram IVQ 12 hourly can be given. So this is a uh, antibiotic decision tree. This is, this is basically a thought tree which uh, is seen in the Charleston ethics study. This is not an evidence-based study, but still can make the decision making a little bit more easier. Uh, so in this, if the patient is in full comfort and he does not require any prolongation of life, then there is no role for antibiotics in such a patient population. The next thing is improve symptoms. If the, uh, if the patient and the relatives want to improve the symptoms and as a physician, you want to improve the symptoms and prolong life if possible. So first we have to think is that will the treatment improve the survival and relieve the patient's symptoms? If you think the treatment will improve the symptoms uh, or improve the survival, the next thing we have to think about is that will the patient be surviving the 72 hours in order to get an antimicrobial benefit. So if a yes, then the patient can, or uh, the next thing we have to think is if the patient can take it orally or no. So if the patient can take it orally, we have to always uh, see the burden benefit ratio and then go for a trial antibiotics. The last scenario is that the patient and the relatives want an aggressive care uh, and needs life prolongation at any cost is, uh, will the treatment improve the survival? So the same question again and we have to balance the risk benefit ratio and decide on giving a, a trial of antibiotics. So in a nutshell, uh, antibiotics are they palliative or non-palliative? That is actually highly individual based because it differs from scenario and different cases. Now how to appro finally approach uh, the decision making whether to give antibiotics or not. So this is basically uh, we can use the shared decision making model where the physician as well as a family member as, as, well as the patient has got a role to play and finally come down to a decision on whether to give or not. The most common indications mainly we give uh, antibiotics and palliative care uh, in end of life for symptom control as well as to relieve pain and to prolong survival. So uh, the question uh, that we all had was when to treat. So when to treat, we always go with the principle of the intent. What is the intent of treating? Is the intent aligned with the goals of the patient? So, and also the primary purpose of giving antibiotics in end of life is to ameliorate their distressing symptoms. And it is always a task of the clinician to balance the benefit versus harm and action versus inaction. So uh, we had a lot of myths uh, before uh, coming to a consensus about this topic. So all patients in end of life needs antibiotics, not at all. All patients does not require, if the patient is having a comfortable decline in life, it is not required to give antibiotics. Antibiotics can prolong life and is beneficial to patient. Not always, not all patients antibiotics will be beneficial. So that also is an, based on an individual basis. Uh, all infections in end of life needs to be treated. So not all infections need to be treated only based on the principles we just explained, like for symptom control, the objective has to align with the patients as well. So uh, the next one is all infections end of life responds well to antibiotics. No, not all infections respond well. It is mainly the UTIs and secondly, the respiratory infection that responds, uh, that responds in a well manner to infections, um, of infections that respond to antibiotics. The next one is physician decides on whether to continue withhold or withdraw antibiotics. That is not the case. The, uh, the final decision as to whether to withheld or withdraw antibiotics is actually a team decision. Then adding antibiotics always improves quality of life. No, it does not. It doesn't happen always. And, this, and the reasons has been discussed earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adila. That was a very well done presentation. I request everyone if they have any questions or queries to kindly put it on the chat box. I think there is a question, Shamli. Uh, can antibiotics be administered by subcutaneous route, if any? Uh, I'm unaware of any antibiotic that can be given via subcutaneous route. 
uh, the uh, exception the sestria zone which can be given im i understand that we avoid giving im injections in our settings because it's very painful uh, in that in that cases in such cases we actually have to discuss the gold care and do we actually want to give antibiotic if we don't even have an iv access uh, if iv access is not feasible um uh, i think minakshi of the minakshi has raised her hand minakshi please go ahead and i wanted to ask you a question too but minakshi please go ahead minakshi ma'am you can unmute now Okay, yeah, I was not able to unmute, unmute myself, sorry. Um, actually, in the context of the subcutaneous antibiotic administration, I think uh, there, there was a document from NHS. I will uh, share it. I, I have to locate it. It's not in the system. I, I will locate it and I will uh, share it. It was a, a rather recent one. Dr. Sunita Daniel had shared it from the UK. So uh, that gives a very clear guidance on which antibiotics can be given um, uh, uh, through the subcutaneous route. Thank you, and very good presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you so much, ma'am. Yep. If you uh, send it, then we can add it to the uh, reference uh, list. And on that note, Manakshi, I just wanted to ask you, what about what is your experience in your hospice? Uh, in the hospice, ma'am, we uh, try to avoid uh, IV antibiotics and uh, keep it to the very uh, simple antibiotics like uh, ciprofloxacin, um, uh, moxclav, uh, metronidazole. Uh, very rarely, sometimes when uh, when we are shifting patients from ICU, uh, in that case, we might uh, consider one or ways of you know, and if you know the antibiotic course uh, is uh, at the end of its uh, uh, you know duration. That day, at that time, we might consider uh, sending a, a, a day supply or you know one and a half day supply if that is what is pending. Apart from that, we don't uh, we, we avoid uh, using uh, uh, you know uh, higher generation antibiotics, um, and uh, we use a lot of nitrofurantoin for our uh, UTIs. Uh, it serves, uh, I mean, a good symptom control, like uh, Doctor uh, had uh, put up in her presentation. So thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Minakshi. Um, and Ajila, of course, there are lots of compliments on your presentation, and it really was uh, very uh, beautifully done, easy to understand, and taking us through step by step. And it it was so very practical. So I guess that is the reason why there are not uh, many questions. Um, I just wanted to, uh, there are uh, seniors with us and I wanted their uh, experience to be shared also. Uh, so Dr. Jennifer, I think uh, you have been there from the beginning. So if you want to add something. So uh, thank you very much. I think it was a very clear, uh, very, um, she has also brought out different uh, probabilities and combinations or considering the disease status, patient, caregivers, uh, goals in terms of uh, even giving antibiotics. So I think it was a very clear presentation. Uh, again, the same, um, it's beautiful that across uh, the delivery of palliative care, the approach remains very uh, similar, isn't it? From symptom management to consideration of any intervention, we are looking primarily at quality of life, uh, symptom distress or overall distress, is it going to help that? What is the risk and benefit? The risk and benefit also has to be considered holistically, physical, financial, convenience, psychological, and um, are we ethically right or wrong in doing that? So I think we are still guided by these principles and these need to be uh, considered at every individual based situation uh, the one thing to be careful about is not to jump into giving antibiotics every time and especially at end of life and if someone's actively dying not to get into that reflex of uh, giving antibiotics which i think most of us in palliative care are very aware of and we do take into consideration all these factors so i think it was a very excellent clear presentation but the subcute antibiotics is a new thing for me also. So look forward to 
Meenakshi sharing that. But again, I wonder uh, in someone who's needing subcute. Anyway, we will look at the document, you know, whether, where are we stretching it, but I'm sure they, they've also come out with some evidence. So based on some evidence, so we look forward to that and congratulations on that excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Dr. Shandi, do you want to take Dr. Lipika Patra's question? Um, yes, uh, she's asking many times we start antibiotic for symptom relief in UTI without doing culture sensitivity. Should we wait or should, or should we wait for the test report? So uh, like we have discussed, our intent is to control the symptoms. But, so ideally, if you want to control the symptoms, you cannot wait for four days or five days for the reports to come. So we do start empirical antibiotics in such patients. Uh, we look for 48 hours. We look if the symptoms are getting controlled. If we look if there are any impact of that antibiotic. Like uh, if not symptom control, then has the fever settled down? Has the count come down? Um, is the burning decreased? So uh, all these things. And if we find that the antibiotic is working, we'll continue it without waiting for the report. Thank you, Dr. Samli. And uh, Dr. Uh, Macadon Star is also there. So may I request Dr. Macadon to please share his experience and some guidance for us? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. I really enjoyed uh, uh, listening to it. And uh, just I would share from the home care perspective, uh, it common, uh, chest infection is a very common thing. And uh, an oral antibiotic like azithromycin, just once a day, for two, three days, if it helps, it, it really helps to, uh, you know, give symptom relief also, you know, because cough is quite distressing, especially when you have multiple bone metastasis and things like that. So azithromycin is a simple antibiotic. And at home, we make this decision right from the beginning that we will not go for IV antibiotics because IV antibiotics is very difficult to manage at home. And it would usually mean hospitalization, and then things are out of your control. You know. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Minakshi has said that uh, if there is no fever, they would try to wait for the culture sensitivity report. So, I guess that that is something to be considered as well. Uh, I also want to invite some of our palliative medicine seniors to please uh, give their uh, experience and comments. So I think Dr. Vikram is still here. Dr. Vikram, would you like to uh, give your perspective for Hazira? Oh, he has left. All right. Fine. So, um, anyone else wants to? Because we finish quite in time and leaves a uh, good time for uh, discussion. Uh, if anyone else wants to say in the next few minutes, uh, please go ahead. Um, if actually, sorry. I would like to ask a question. Uh, it, yeah. It's open for everyone. Uh, we are here talking about starting antibiotics, but if you're not having a good symptom control, what is the role of stepping up? Uh, to higher antibiotics. Should that be considered? Probably our antibiotic is not working in that particular organism or infection. So um, do you all step up antibiotics and go for higher level of antibiotic like meropenem, imipenems, or uh, should we just stop at the first line? What is the general practice everywhere? <coughs> Sorry. I think end of life, we would not go up to a higher antibiotic. And that 48 hour rule, I think is very good. Uh, I can stretch it at the most to 72, but our practices usually go to follow the PCF. Uh, but if anybody else has a different uh, opinion, please do. But I wonder if anybody would step up because that would be a goal of care already discussed with the family because we are talking about symptom uh, alleviation, uh, shared decision-making with goals of care for uh, starting as well as the limiting. So that would have come into this, but of course you and I are in the same institution, so I cannot talk uh, over to others. Please please do answer Shami's question. 
Ma'am, I would just like to add uh, uh, that uh, this this uh, dilemma in a, in an hmm. oncology center. I mean, I think it will be fairly clear whether we are at the end of life or where we are. Hmm. But hmm. Uh, in 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 a non oncology situation where there are neurological problems and this hmm. is a frequent uh, that this frequent dips and uh, recoveries hmm. are common. I mean, hmm. I think uh, again, like you said, the goals of life. If the patient has hmm. been in and out of hospital frequently in the last six months. And mm. you know the the pre morbid condition is the function status is poor. I mean mm. that's the point where I think uh, we we decide okay we are not going to step up. Otherwise, if the if the culture sensitivity uh, doesn't align, that is a place where we could uh, you know uh, uh, give it give a trial of forty eight hours again, which is a very nice uh, a, a two the, the two day rule, very easy to apply mm -hmm. uh, into our practice. I think that's mm. uh, that's where it stands. But people who are doing non, I think Dr. Stan could uh, add in here because he's doing mm. a lot of non non oncology uh, palliative care. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Minnaxi. I think uh, Dr. Gita has made an interesting point: is that uh, stepping up has to be done only based on evidence from culture reports. Otherwise, we uh, multi drug resistance. Uh, in the society. So we have to think of the community and uh, as well. So I agree, Dr. Manakshi, we are, uh, I think it is much easier for us in the oncology setting and in non oncology, uh, a little more careful consideration needs to be uh, done. Um, so I think if there are no more questions, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ajila, for an excellent comprehensive easy to understand taking us through step by step what and uh, dr shamli for moderating as well as helping ajila with the presentation which i knew you did and uh, all of us the take home messages are we should be careful for antibiotic use at the end of life the primary purpose is for symptom alleviation it has to be on the background of a good goals of care dis dis discussion and shared decision making with starting as well as a limit to stopping for which it is a two day rule uh, 48 hour rule as per the PCF. We launched the common infections at the end of life and what if we wanted to use, which antibiotics we could use. I really like the paper from the ethics that flowchart as to when to consider. And overall, and oh, thank you all the teachers and seniors for giving their perspectives and experiences. And thanks to everybody who has said it's an excellent presentation. Uh, so that's a very good learning for today. Thank you very much uh, and have a good day wherever you are. Thank you. And we'll see you next week.